What, what I believe is that family business is the longevity of family business is being squeezed now more than it ever has before. And so what we have here today is a set of ideas and methods for how we might prolong the family business journey, as it were. And like every business, family businesses want to succeed. They want to do well. They want to climb the arc of profitability and growth. But family businesses have another interest that goes beyond the typical business that isn't family oriented, and that is to continue. Some 88% of surveyed business founders, if they have the choice, want to, con want to transfer the business on to their progeny, to their offspring, 88%. So it's a vast number of founders who actually do want to make this transfer and keep it in the family, notwithstanding how much we hear about exit planning and selling the business, if there's a person who's got someone in their family who's near to their age, their first choice is going to be to pass that business on to the family. That's still a very strong vibration within founder-generated businesses. Now, many of you have heard this phrase before, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves. It's probably actually getting even a little bit tired. But what that phrase represents is the unfortunate historical record for family business where the first generation, the founder of the business, rolls up his or her sleeves gets to work, creates a business, second generation comes along and enjoys the benefits of all of that good hard labor from the first generation, and then come the third generation, the wealth or the value has been squandered to the point where the third generation has to roll up their sleeves and get dirty again and start it all over. Now that may not apply to every business that you know and operate, but it is the norm largely worldwide historically. In fact, my Mandarin speaking son tells me that Fubu Guo San Dai is the Chinese expression, which is also similar to this, which means fundamentally that whatever success we've generated with our business, we've got three generations, and that's all we've got. After that, we've got to do it all over again. And there's Spanish translations, Italian translations. The world over has known this phenomenon associated with family business. And if we're to accomplish anything in this conversation, it will be to talk about those ideas which get us past that historical rigidity and that end point, which doesn't necessarily have to be our, our fate. Startup businesses in the US correspond with this three generation problem in that for any business that gets started up in the US today in recent history, 15% of those businesses will ultimately survive for five years or more of selling activity and profits. 30% of those 15 companies, let's say we've got a, 100 companies that start up today, 15 of them will, will move on successfully. 30% of that 15, or just under five, will actually pass that business on to the second generation. And 12% of that original 15, now we're down to about two companies, will make it to the third. When you get to the fourth, now you're dealing with numbers less than one, fractional quantities, very, very small percentages that move. And when we take that recent historical data and we place it against the, the longevity or the long historical record, we see that it still fits pretty nicely within this, and I shouldn't say nicely, because it fits within the tragedy, if you will, of the three generational story. Now, notwithstanding that, the economic performance of family business is sterling when contrasted with non-family business. Remarkably, there is no greater economic engine than family business. Some 50% of the US GDP, 70 to 85% of all the businesses in North America. Job creation, 85% <coughs> of all the businesses created in the US since the year 2000 are family business sourced jobs. Social responsibility, many of you who know or serve family businesses know that it is the greatest source of philanthropy from the corporate side of the equation. People, because their names are associated with their business, tend to act as better corporate citizens. Speed to market, less encumbered by the layers of bureaucracy that tend to characterize a larger organization. So when the choice is made, we can move quickly, more quickly into action. Return on investment, I'll share with you some figures as we go along, remarkably better than non-family business. And then very downturn resilient primarily perhaps because they're less leveraged businesses than their counterparts. 
but it's also a place where jobs are maintained. We don't, we don't cut to the bone during downturns in family business, so we come out of them stronger. And when you consider the founder-led performance of businesses, when the founder is still at the helm, this study done by Bain Consulting, and it was in the Harvard Business Review not too long ago, shows that their study of the Standard & Poor 500 firms since 1990 to 2014, founder-led businesses, returned three times the shareholder returns of non-family businesses. So when the founder's at the helm, this is an engine that purrs. But we've still got this background, this legacy that prevails. But when we're in that first generation, when that founder is operating at the helm of that business, the performance of it is, is unremarkable how that performance is fueling that kind of arc of performance that we see from family business. Jeffrey West is the author of a book called Scale, if you happen to have heard of it or not. This is a physicist. This is a guy who operates out of the Santa Fe Institute and focuses on complexity science and complexity theory. And he has studied the scaling effects on cities, living organisms, and businesses and come away with some remarkable findings as to how businesses actually correspond very closely in their scaling histories as do living organisms. Their mortality rates, their survivability, pretty remarkable stuff. It's early days for some of this stuff, but I find it fascinating, and I think it fits in family business perfectly. And what he has studied here is they took 28,853 companies that have been on the Standard & Poor's Index since 1950 and identified their mortalities, or when these companies actually went out of business. And when he scaled it logarithmically, as you see here, it actually ends up producing a straight line. And you can see that the, the, irrespective of the industry or the age of the company, the, the pace of departing the scene, if you will, leaving the commercial gene pool is as you see it here. And so whereas in the early days, in the 50s of the Standard & Poor Index, you might have had an average life of about 58 years or more. You can see as people are falling out, and these dots mark the mortalities of these companies, you can actually see where people are, businesses are starting to leave faster. Their lives are being shortened and abbreviated. Moreover, if you look at the top right-hand corner, I've drawn a line into the more recent mortality ages of companies, and you can see that it's being squeezed even more. So when we're out there in the 30s for a lifespan, typical for a company compared to the 60 year and more before, you can see where that third generation is now being squeezed into the second generation as a norm. And this is the pace of socioeconomic change. This is the forces of complexity all bringing to bear upon business, and particularly on family business, in abbreviating their likely lifespans unless we do very substantial things and act in very substantial ways. More to say about that later. But the emphasis here is that, as I say, we're starting to see this squeeze effect going on from what the data is telling us. And our challenge is to get beyond that. This is a typical, if we apply systems thinking, and many of the theorists believe that systems thinking is the right approach to take to understanding family business and how to unravel some of the restrictions that we've got there. This is a typical behavior over time chart that reflects one of the system archetypes called limits to success. And within that, as I'll show you later, there are reinforcing feedback loops, and then there are resisting feedback loops in any system. And with family business being a system, we can see that the overtime performance of any system with those characteristics is very much like what we see from a family business. And our task here is to <coughs> break this trend and move beyond hopefully some of these ideas and methods will serve in that purpose. So what have we got here? We've got this seven points, seven pivotal points in the evolution of a family business that I've identified as being places where if we act in certain ways, if we are a certain way, we're more likely to help prolong the family business. And as I considered each one of the seven, a C word kept coming up for me to represent it. And so I ended up with seven C's. And so you can see where the sailing and the, and the navigational thing comes in. And it's a metaphor that I just couldn't quit. So I had to add this sort of illustration to my, uh, my approach for you today.
the passages between the seas, which are oftentimes in sailing lore the more trepidatious places to, to move about on the seas. And so I'm going to offer specific actions between the seas as we make this journey together. What is the background of the work that supports this? I'm a former non-family CEO in two family businesses, which provides a, an interesting perspective, as some of you would recognize. Uh, I have served as a coach or consultant or advisor for some 24 family businesses, some of which have extended over multiple years. So there's a great source of learning I derive from those family businesses that I've served. And I've been a course developer and teach the family business topic at uh, HALT in Boston. And so this is the, the background experience from which this information I'm sharing with you largely comes from. Most of it time tested with clients. And the interests that influence you won't help but be able to see that these topics, which are three of my loves, if you will, the topic of leadership, which I also teach and coach individuals, uh, <laughs> philosophy, which it seems to increase in, in my thinking, perhaps in my third, 30 chapter of life. And then the whole subject of complexity, because these forces that we really don't quite understand fully are bearing down on business performance, and we've got to get a grip on them if we're going to help our clients or ourselves prevail. So let's take those three interests that I have and apply them right away to the first C in this discussion. And in this first C, I've, I've chosen the word care, and that may seem like a curious or an odd word to use for starting the journey of a family business. But here I philosophically refer to Martin Heidegger, who was a German philosopher. Many of you may know the name or have read him. But um, he used the German word Sorge to represent what he described as being the genuine characteristics from human beings. That we, we, we react to those things that matter to us. We attend to the things in life that give us concern. So this is not caring for, necessarily. It's more about caring to. It's more about being propelled into action by something that matters to you. And when it comes to starting a business, I can't think of a better word to represent where it all begins. When somebody starts a business, there has to be a deep commitment of time and treasure to such an undertaking. And that really requires an authentic person operating authentically to be able to do that. So we start with this concern. We start with this recognition of something that matters to us enough to actually go out and start a business. Big undertaking, as you know. As we go through the event cycle of any leadership activity, again with this first spur, this, this first care to move into action, we ultimately will have an idea, it translates to action, and it requires followers to continue it on. If we expand on this a little bit and introduce what I call the eyes of a leader, we, it requires our imagination to move from the initial concern, that matter which has prompted us into action, to the idea, to the crystallation of the, ah, I can see this business of mine in the future. And if there's enough self-belief, enough strength of character to say, I can do this, we then move into action. This is often a, a stumbling point for many businesses that never get started that are these ideas or grand visions that people have without the belief in oneself to move forward and act, they fall, they fall dead. Now as we move, move beyond that from initiative into action, ultimately we have to influence followers to come along with us. What often doesn't happen, I think, as businesses get started is that the founders don't recognize this as being more than a business development or a business startup activity. Whereas I believe we're talking about the onset of a leadership exercise. We're talking about the demonstration of something truly authentic to that person where they've committed their selves to this and to get followers to choose to follow them instead of just simply being hired to do work is a very important criteria we'll see later on when we get to that transition in a family business where succession is on the table. And as you know, that's where often the tragic ending of so many family businesses occurs. This is the place to begin to prevent that tragedy from happening by inducing people to choose to follow what it is you're trying to create. And so here we're talking about not just starting a business, not just hiring people to do work, but to get them to follow and to believe in what it is you're creating this business for. In this space, in this first passage between the care sufficient to start a business and the company that we create, 
What I often see happen with my clients is that they cannot precisely see the forward image of the business. And so what I try to do with them is to get them to focus on just the 24-month horizon. I'm sure you remember, because it's a phrase that for some of us with gray hair that we used to use, the five-year plan. Well, today, a five-year plan would effectively eliminate 25% of the businesses that are publicly traded. Because the half-life of all publicly traded businesses is now 10 and a half years. So five-year plans, forget <coughs> it. That's a phrase you can dismiss. If we can actually focus precisely on a 24-month horizon, it gives us the best chance of ultimately seeing where the hurdles are in front of us and what we're going to need for provisions on this journey to actually get to where it is we think we want to go. And one of the things I recommend in this phase is to have a seasoned advisor who's been experienced in matters such as this to assist. And that's one of the things that we at Newport do for our clients. So as we move to the second C, we've gone from being in a situation that has prompted us into action to create a business to now being in business. And what are we to be in business for? I think it's a crucially important criteria. And again, I borrow from Heidegger, and that for the sake of which we create a business is central to our prospects for longevity. I often ask my clients when I first are, am engaged with them, um, so what are, you in, what are you in business for? What, what do you love about this activity? What, what's, what's the, what, what lies underneath it for you? And I often get a, 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 a stumbling response because people aren't usually asked this question. And invariably, the response will be, well, we're in it to make money. And, and of course, for a commercial enterprise, you really have got to be concerned with generating a profit. But what I often find is that what they truly are in it for is for their own income is as a means to an end, as a means to look after their families. And the fear I have for businesses with that intent is that you're not going to induce people to follow you if you're, what you're interested in is your own income. And you're not going to create any kind of imaginative outcome where you follow the track of your customers and their moving interests and changes and preferences when you're thinking about yourself. You've got to be in the business to be of service to others based on some requirement, and hopefully from that do it profitably where you can look after your own personal concerns. As we move out from that one, one row, if you will, or one leap, some people will go into business because they've got a product idea, they've got an offering, they've got something that the market is just going to beat a path to my door once they see this thing. And that's very close to the person themselves because after that offering, whether it lands or it doesn't land in people's interests, what's left after that? I think what's more sustainable, what's more likely to ensure the longevity of family business is to be concerned about a problem, a market need, something out there in the world that people are feeling enough about to want to pay someone to fix it, to address it, to assist them with it, and enough interest to get people to follow you with this business mission to care enough about it to put themselves in it. And if it's just you or it's just your offering, you're not going to attract people in that deep, authentic way to get them to commit to this business mission going forward. And remember, we're talking about trying to sustain a multi-generational family business. We're going to have to have deep roots like market problems, market needs, market interests that serves us and propels us forward. When we move from company to the third C of competence, the structure of this vessel that we're creating is important. And where I see things fall down is, and if, you, if anyone has read the book, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, it's a pretty common book. Lots of small business owners have, have read it. His counsel is, I think, is the right counsel, which is if you're going into this enterprise as the doer, or if you're locked into thinking that you can't trust your staff and your people to do this work and you end up doing it yourself, it's, it's the death knell. You will soon not even pass through any kind of generational transfer. And so the, the promotion here is that we've got to make sure, and again, having seasoned counsel to assist and to bounce ideas off of and to challenge your thinking is to move out of this frame of being the doer to at least being the manager. I mean, we may, we may need to do enough to actually show people what it is we expect, but we've got to move into managing so that we've transferred the responsibility of doing it. And then ultimately to step back from that and look at it as an entrepreneur or as a business founder with other possible businesses to found in its wake. This is the road to the prospects for longevity in, 
this passage. 